Uh, it's, it has been a good week so far. We have had three comics in a row that are all good. I feel bad I spent a lot of time mourning in the Defenders one. Actually, add on. If you can properly separate it from the retcons, this is a great story. Jim Tomart has, has a proper comic here. It has its ideas and its themes. There is the lovely conceit of this team of disparate characters. They are not acting like a team. They are each trying to take the villain on by themselves. But to overcome the villain, they have to learn to act as a team. Really good, professional, proper comics. The rest cons are travesty. This is another good one too. This is the first issue of Spider-Man Team-Up, which was a fairly decent length series from 2005. This is written by Robert Kirkham, and I will recommend this to two of my subscribers. Billy Joe Jenkins, I think you will appreciate this, and Kura Mai or Kuramai's, because he never acknowledges when I ask him how to say his name. I think you will at least enjoy the big Titanus story and the new Warriors one. All in all, this is a great series, and it hasn't been reprinted since its original run due to Marvel's executive editor having a one-sided vendetta with the writer. I won't get into that in this. I can't spend every video slandering Tom B. Voth. But yeah, outside of Marvel Zombas, Robert Kirkham's Marvel stuff has not been kept in print out of petty spite. There was a time when the original trade paperbacks would fetch some high prices on the aftermarket, but I think that has died down. Although I am guessing some issues of this series now do sell for quite a lot by what I call scalpers, who are exploiting things like that one of the central bad guys in this series is an alternative reality Iron Man who is introduced with a green cloak to make us think that it is Mr. Doom. And oh my god, Robert Downton Abbey Jr. MCU Mr. Doom variant confirms. First appearance here, folks. This is your key to MCU Phase 9. The bad guys are all great in this series. We get a host of new villains introduced. And they, unfortunately, never appeared again. But excellent baddies. This first story doesn't have one such bad guy though. And overall, it is one of the most boring and uninspired team-up prospects. Spider-Man and Wolfman. I have never once in my life enjoyed these two teaming up. And this probably charts all the way back to Spider-Man vs. Wolfman, which is atrocious. If that is your favourite comic of all time, I don't respect you as a person. Were I to make clickbait list videos, that would be on most my lists of worst things. Spider-Man. He is one of those characters I do feel the need to always explain where we are at with him when I review his comics. 
Spider-Man has gone through so many different phases and eras. And something like this, it is important to know. And there is a major character direction heavily included in this. This was 2005. So we were in the throes of JGMS Michael GMS Straczynski's run. But moreover, the parts people didn't like much. There are three important things from those comics we will see in this series. First, on display in full force in this issue, Peter Parker is a high school science teacher. I will talk about that, don't worry, we will come to that. Mary James, she was brought back to... She is once again our amazing spider wife. Lastly... We don't get any of it in this issue, but future issues will acknowledge it. Aunt Tome found out that her nephew is Spider-Man for the first time, because the actual first time was retconned away. We have a very run-of-the-mill plot set up. Wolfman is in New York. He has come in search of a muty that the excellent men detected. And as bland as that is, Robert Kirkham, he does do a clever twist by the close of the issue. We have a needless and rather unexciting action scene with Spider-Man. He stops the robbery of an armoured van I don't entirely know it's not shown or showcased that well but this causes Peter Parker to once again be late for work he is late for class and here is where we get to talk about Peter Parker as a high school science teacher. As an idea, it is wonderful. It is a career that makes absolute sense for the character of Peter Parker. It is a perfect direction to go. And it gives us a sense of forward momentum with Peter Parker that we have often been denied in the modern age. A lot of fresh storyline potential to be told there. For Peter Parker, it is excellent. For Spider-Man, it's bad. Spider-Man cannot have a day job with set hours. What if Sandman robs a bank at 11am? Something we maybe haven't thought about is how ingenious... Stanley Lee and Steve Dittman were when they gave Peter Parker a job as a freelance photographer. It was a means of employment where he could financially survive as required, but which was flexible enough that it would never interfere with his Spider-Man adventures. They even went above and beyond. They didn't need to provide any further rationalisation, but they then made it so that even his come-and-go job was tied to his second life as Spider-Man. So it absolutely in no way made him, being Spider-Man, a problem. At the end of the day though, I love our scenes in this by Robert Kirkham with Peter as a teacher and Peter working at the school. We have this bit with him talking to the other staff at lunch. As an idea, I really am on board with Peter Parker as a teacher, but I don't think it was even 
really thought much on by the writers. Being a teacher isn't just working nine to five. Often it is working seven to six. And even after that, a teacher takes their work home with them. They have to mark tests and plan lessons. It is two full time for a character who is meant to be a major superhero. Some I will praise to the I Evans is that one of the teachers, a woman, she wants to fuck Peter Parker. She is very horny for Peter Parker. And that is great. I like this Peter Parker who is attractive to middle-aged women in education. I prefer this Peter Parker over the version we have to put up with who gets dumped to the extreme. Peter Parker, to me, is a character that is so nice and decent that I think women are naturally attracted to him. That he doesn't realise this. That he sees himself still as an outsider and a nerd. It is part of his character. He remains with the belief that he isn't what he is. A superhero who the world admire. And a man of the strongest principles. At school, it is nice to see Robert Kirkham, even as the main plot revolve around Peter Parker's job. There is a plus-sized kid getting bullied and beaten, and he displays some muty powers. You know how... Our two characters are going to converge now. After school, Spider-Man confronts the kids. He is called Paul. Uh-oh, Spider-Man, watch out. He might cook you like the other Paul. The trade paperback is called The Golden Child. And while he is never called that in the story... I think it is an appropriate enough name for him. I'm not that into the comedy with Paul being able to recognise that Spider-Man is Peter Parker because they have the same voice. But Spider-Man is trying to give Paul some support. He is letting him know that he's not alone and that even Spider-Man went through the same things. It is here where Wolfman gets here and Paul uses his golden child powers to attack Wolfman who keeps appearing as if he is about to attack them. It is half amusing to see Wolfman get consistently knocked over by this random child. So Spider-Man is protecting Paul the Golden Child from Wolfman. And we have a short little fight between Spider-Man and Wolfman. We also started this issue in media res with the aftermath of this encounter and I didn't even mention it. I was too busy saying I find Spider-Man and Wolfman to be a boring pairing. They are not two characters that I like together. There is a lot of Spider-Man and Wolfman in this series. Even when they are not the titular team-up features. And the only time anything is done with it I find exceptional is issue 5. 
when we subvert it a tiny bit by having Spider-Man and X-32. That one derives some good humour from the familiarity a reader will have from issues 1 and 2 featuring Spider-Man and Wolfman. Before we get to the twist ending, a twist that I think Robert Kirkham weaves around well enough that you don't see it coming, but on rereads you notice all the clear indicators. This is Spider-Man team-up, but Spider-Man actually isn't in all of them. He is in a lot of them, but he isn't in all of them. After our first two-parter, we have Fantastic Force and Doctor Strange. We have Iron Man and Hulk. We have Captain America and Scarlett Johansson. And this is another thing, actually. This series picks up after and continues with a few little strands from Robert Kirkham's excellent four-issue run on Captain America. And then after this series ends, the creative team continue on with Pervert Ant-Man. You've got a good little cycle here of the overall quality and style continuing on. Punishing Wesley Snipes, I remember that one. What I like about this series though, what I think maybe the original Spider-Man team-up series should have became more often, after our first collection, it isn't two characters teaming up. We have big team-ups of multiple characters often. Spider-Man and Wolfman are usually there too. And we do still have issues in the mix that are those smaller team-ups. There's one that's Wolfman and Cables. And that one is a continuity insert. It's meant to finally reveal the unseen history of Cables and Wolfman. Because editor Tom Beevort didn't realise that they had already revealed that history. The big superhero slugfests, the big team-ups, they are great. And it's not all marquee characters. Black Star appears plenty. Sun Man is in a bunch. And then there is that New Warriors story, which features a team of B... No, I would say C, list stars. And a D-list one with Terra Inc. It always felt like this was closer to the Marvel comics I want to read. We have got a writer who is having fun. And he is writing stories that could have been told 20 years ago or whenever. And he is still presenting them with his modern flair and enhancements. He's not trying to warp modern comics into being his own thing. He is doing the sort of story he would have enjoyed to get his hands on in his youth. Paul the Golden Child takes Spider-Man back to his pads. And if you think the twist ending is going to be Spider-Man starts molesting an underage boy, you might be disappointed because our reveal is that Paul is actually a villain. He murdered his abusive dad and likely was going to murder kids at his school for bullying him. And Spider-Man learns this by seeing his dad's rotten corpse, which has been sat in the house for a few days. 
This works because everything we are meant to think about Paul prior to this is Spider-Man projecting onto him. Spider-Man is seeing himself in Paul. So we as readers also see Paul as similar to Peter Parker before he became Spider-Man. But at no point does Paul show any semblance of a character that doesn't go with this idea. We assume he is a bit socially inept and angry and rude because of his bullying situation. We miss the warning signs. The comic tries to trick us into being on his side. It is a good swerve that plays with what we were seeing here. This continues into the second issue, which is Spider-Man and Wolfman again. It is a shame that these stories are not that readily available to people. They are a diamond right there in the middle of the 2000s. They showed a series that could have lasted far longer than it did. And it received the backing that it deserved. This should have become one of the main Marvel titles. At least as long as Robert Kirkham was writing it. He was delivering the goods and doing stories that felt like events in a way the publicised and promoted event storylines did not. The first battle with Titanus, issues 11, 12 and 13, that feels more weighty and important than scrolls. There are scrolls, lots of scrolls. I think I will give a 7 thumbs up to Spider-Man Team Up Issue 1.